and welcome to the European Space Operations Centre. Uh, we're here for the launch of Sentinel-1B tonight on our third attempt and we're going to take you behind the scenes at the control centre here. My name is Thomas Ormston, I'm a spacecraft operations engineer with the Earth Observation Missions Division and I'm here with... Daniel Skuka. I'm the senior editor for spacecraft operations here at uh, the European Space Operations Center. It's ESA's mission control center in Darmstadt, Germany. I'm going to be working in the tech tonight. Thomas is going to be our, our host and uh, moderator, and we're going to take you uh, behind the scenes of what's going on here at ESOC as we get ready for uh, going to space tonight. Thomas, over to you. Okay. So, We've just heard that the weather in Kourou is still looking good and uh, they've started fueling the, the launch vehicle or the rocket. Uh, the weather here in Darmstadt is sunny but a little bit cold so uh, we're going to take you inside the control centre now. And uh, just passing by on, our, on the left side here we have Rosetta which is uh, something that no doubt you'll all have heard of but uh, not the star for tonight's launch. And do you know, do you know what that red light means? That red light means that it's on at the moment. So cool. <laughs> Rosetta is switched on, or at least okay. our Rosetta. But most importantly tonight, of course, uh, Sentinel 1B is also switched on. Um, we're talking to it from our control center, where we'll uh, take a look in a moment. We're talking to it uh, via data links across the Atlantic, and we can see that the satellite is currently healthy and uh, raring to go. As are most of we. Uh, it's been a tough couple of days having to deal with a couple of failed launch attempts due to uh, high altitude winds but today we're hoping for today we're hoping for better conditions and a nice launch at 2302 Central European time. So we're here now in the operations building here at ESOC and uh, the first room that we're going to walk past is where all of our maths geniuses work. Uh, there's not many in the moment. They've uh, taken advantage of a slight lull in the countdown to go and get their dinner. But these people are pretty much some of the best mathematicians in Europe, or at least we think so. Uh, they're the ones that are responsible for working out all of the orbits, uh, working out where Sentinel-1B is going to be, and then communicating that to the teams controlling the spacecraft and also to the ground stations, because the ground stations are tracking dishes around the world, need to know where to point to look at Sentinel-1B. And of course all of this they have to do in uh, the few seconds after launch, and uh, that takes quite a lot of math, so uh, that's what these guys will be doing a little bit later on tonight. Also part of our team of teams here at ESOC um, are the ground station teams here at the ESTRAC Control Centre. And uh, ESTRAC control is where we control all of our ground stations. We have dishes all over the world that we'll be watching tonight for uh, Sentinel-1B. We'll be using dishes in Karuna in uh, northern Sweden, in Svalbard. We'll also be using dishes in Alaska uh, to track the spacecraft as it goes around to give our teams coverage that they need to be able to talk to the satellite during those critical few mm. moments just before launch. But carrying on here, <laughs> we'll go past the, uh, the normal Sentinel control room. Tonight our teams are working in the main control room at ESOC, um, but you'll see that the control room for Sentinel-1A, for Sentinel-2A, and for Sentinel-3 is very dark and quiet tonight. Uh, that's exactly as expected. Um, our satellites are clever enough, and our ground systems are clever enough, uh, that we can run our satellites effectively on autopilot through the night. Uh, however, just after launch, which we'll see in a moment, you need a lot more people there to uh, monitor the satellite when it first arrives in space. Throughout the broadcast, if you have any questions, uh, you can send, it to us, send them to us and we'll try and answer them live, or if not, on Twitter after the broadcast. So we're approaching the main control room now, and on the door of the main control room you can see... Uh, Part of a tradition that we have here at ESOC, all of the missions here like to send their best wishes to any mission that's launching. So we have one from here from ExoMars, uh, this one is from one of the other Sentinels. From here we've got Sentinel-5P, from Sentinel-3, and even from Gaia. So all of the teams have got together to uh, wish Sentinel-1B luck on this, well, as we say, third attempt at launching today. And I think we're sort of hoping that uh, three times is lucky. 
that's the plan. That's the plan. Our third time is lucky. So, finally, we're going to go around the corner here. And we're heading to the main control room here at ESOP. So through these doors is the briefing room. And here in the briefing room <laughs> is um, the area where we host VIPs or families during the actual launch. And it's also uh, the place where the teams can come and relax, get a biscuit or a drink, um, and also where they can discuss what's going on uh, with the satellite in between passes. And Good, great. Okay, we're back on. And we're live. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody that was watching. Uh, we're back again, and um, we're going to uh, run straight in now because we're uh, closing in on our slot that we have for Periscope before the engineers in the main control room need to get going again. Sorry for the technical issues. As we said on our tweets, sometimes internet technology is quite a bit harder than flying spacecraft. <laughs> Sebastian Martin. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. And uh, I'm just going to ask Sebastian some questions. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, and we can't spend too long with Sebastian because he's got some very important things to uh, to get going very soon. But uh, Sebastian, can you tell us what your responsibility is? Um, I'm the softcode, the software coordinator. So I'm responsible for the mission control system, the system used to monitor and control the spacecraft. Um, from this perspective here, I have a bit of an all-seeing eye over the whole room, so I check that everybody has everything in order. I am also connected with the loops to a room full of very capable people who help me investigate if there are any problems. So if we see, notice any problems on the systems, uh, we fix them. Um, we have the procedures in place on what to do if something happens, which we practiced in the simulations campaign. Great. And, um, and what's the system that you're actually using? Uh, we are using uh, SCOS 2000. Mm -hmm. It's an ESA-developed system together with the European industry. Mm -hmm. It's our standard satellite control system that we're using for all the ESA missions. And, um, it's and what sort of things does it, does it do then? What, what do we need a control system for? Basically everything that we do with the spacecraft. So we control the spacecraft with it, we send the commands, we monitor the responses, we monitor the health and status of the spacecraft, um, we can patch the software of the spacecraft with it, we archive the data, everything that you can imagine that we have to, to um, communicate with the spacecraft to do from the system. Wow, that's a good system. And for the software people that might be listening, um, what sort of a system is it? I mean, what's it built on? Um, it's built mainly of C or C++. Okay. If you go to, to the software side, we have some components in Java. We are also now in evolution of replacing some of the displays that you can see uh, with newer uh, Java versions of it. It's running on uh, Sun Solaris or on, on SLES, on SUSE Linux. <laughs> and um, yeah, excellent. And. Um, I know that the last few days you've been the first into the control room here and the, the last out. Why is it that you need to be first here and last out? Yeah, unfortunately we are the first to come, the, first, uh, the last to leave. But um, this ensures that everything is running properly for the people when to use it. So we come in in the morning, we set up the systems, we uh, start everything up, we ensure that the connections are correct, that all the components are there, we test that the con components are running correctly. And in the evening, we do archiving and cleanup and everything. So wow. So the last two days with the last two launch attempts we had, that must have been a challenge for you. Mm, not so much challenge of what to do, more of the time. Because, of course, we come every morning, we set everything up, and then it's not happening. So now we were delayed. <laughs> but uh, we have the procedures in place, so it's pretty clear what to do. And then the second mm. time, the third time, it's, it's, it's pretty routine to do. Uh, it was more a matter of time. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian. We're going to carry on around the control room now, and good luck for the launch. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to go around to the front row now, and I'll explain in a minute what all the different positions here do. But we're going to see hey. Pascal now. Hi, hey. Pascal. Hey. So, how are you doing? Good, good. Good, mm -hmm. excellent. So, can you tell us what you do on Sentinel-1? So, I'm a member of the flight control team, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm 
In detail, I'm uh, responsible from the B team for the onboard data handling uh, mm. subsystem. Okay, great. And what does the onboard data handling subsystem do? So it comprises all the, um, let's say, the onboard computer. We call mm. it the software management management unit, and uh, and as well the mass memory, so mm. where we store all the data. The ah, okay. Yeah. And how does that compare to a computer here on Earth? Uh, so a space computer and Earth computer are they similar? Or? <laughs> Uh, they're similar on the principle, but the one we use on board is uh, has um, smaller capacity of storing, mm. and um, and it's also a bit less fast and uh, less <laughs> fast than the one we use on Earth. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. You mentioned that you're on the B team. So, yes. uh, what does the B team actually mean? So, um, for the launch and early orbit phase, so mm -hmm. we need to to work 24 24 hours. Uh, so the mm. flight control team, actually there are two flight control teams. There's the A team, which is mm -hmm. responsible for the, for the operations of the, on the spacecraft just after separation, the critical ones. So they will be on console during the, the launch and the 12 hours following the launch. Mm -hmm. And the B team is here uh, for, the, for the other 12 hours shifts. And um, now the spacecraft is standing on the launch pad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's connected to us via cable, and we can receive Great. telemetry from the spacecraft. So we will check that it was it is in an expected state. Perfect. Oh, uh, that's great. And it's all healthy at the moment. Yes. So far, so good. Can I ask you a quick question, Pascal? You're actually seeing some real data from the spacecraft. Yes. Can so you, here you can you can see uh, the the packets coming from the spacecraft. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see that we have telemetry. And we will lose this link two minutes before before launch, launch. when yeah. they remove the cable. Ah, okay. So and we'll see that on the video stream, I'm sure, yes. when the cable pulls away. So, uh, finally, what would you say the best thing is about working here? Uh, it's working on a spacecraft. It's really cool. Ah, I can't <laughs> argue with that. I can't <laughs> argue with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you. Good Thank luck. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. So we're going to head around the front row here now to uh, see one more engineer. Uh, here in the Sentinel 1B control room, and here we have Carlo. Hi, and Tom. Hello. Hi. Welcome. So, um, we've asked everybody else this so far. Can you tell us a bit about what you do on Sentinel 1B? Yes, I'm a spacecraft, a spacecraft operation engineer uh, for Sentinel 1A and Sentinel 1B for the preparation, mm -hmm. and um, I am the prime. Uh, engineer for the OCP, one of the two payloads, the backup uh, SOE for uh, the SAR, the main payload, and almost the backup for power and thermal. And um, here during the launch, I'm in the B team and I am the, um, the responsible for the power and thermal and the deployment. But yeah. that should not happen during uh, our shift. Yes. Well, you mentioned the deployments though, and uh, I know on Sentinel yes. 1 they're quite critical. So, can you tell yes, us a bit about are. them? Well, we basically have to go from uh, this configuration, which is the configuration that is uh, uh, in which uh, the satellite is currently uh, inside of the fairing, to this configuration with all the solar arrays deployed and the SAR deployed. And well, you can imagine this is a very complex situation because it's uh, it's not like uh, doing something on Earth. Uh, <coughs> If there is an issue, we have to solve it here from ground, and uh, um, it has to be done in the right order. Uh, mm. Otherwise, it could cause problems. So uh, it's long and it can be complicated. So, how long do we expect it to take before Sentinel One is fully deployed? Well, that should take several hours. Several hours. Yes, wow. and okay. um, it should be completed at the end of the the first shift, the okay. A one shift. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the arrays are deployed, yes. um, that's how so Sentinel 1B gets all of its power. Precisely. Um, and uh, how much power do they generate? Do you know? Well, um, at the end of, the, the, uh, of their life, the solar arrays are supposed to generate roughly 5,500, 5,300 watts, which is um, quite a lot for a satellite, good. actually. It yeah. is. Got to power that big radar, I suppose. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, uh, the, the radar can, um, let's say, require up to 4,000 uh, and um, yes, I think just for some comparison here on Earth, um, that's uh, about as much power as you'd need to run a, a washing machine and a dryer <laughs> at the same time, but uh, we managed to scan the Earth in radar with it, so exactly. uh, we're quite economical. Um, so we asked Pascal this, and he told us that yeah. uh, you've got some live data from the satellite right yes, now. Yes, we do. Um, they should have 
moved actually to the A chain, so we mm -hmm. have it on this side. Okay. But it's more or less the same. But okay. I have the same screens here. So, so we'll look we over. And that. what sort of things is the data telling you at the moment? Well, right now we can see the status of the spacecraft. So um, unfortunately, we don't have nice long lines because we mm -hmm. just moved to this uh, this chain. Mm -hmm. But what we can see is that the overall temperature of the uh, fairing, because th that is uh, is obviously it's where the satellite is contained, and uh, it's the temperature is always you know kept sort of constant between 10 and 25 degrees Celsius, and right now is around now nine, between 17 and 19 degrees, depending on the side satellite. These are yeah. basically the two opposite sides. It's uh, a little bit warmer than outside in Darmstadt at the moment. Indeed, indeed, <laughs> yes. Uh, but a lot cooler than uh, in Kuru. That's true, that's <laughs> true, yes. <laughs> and uh, we can also see that the batteries are uh, fully charged. You can see here the voltage is uh, good. We are not charging up. This is the current. Um, so we see Perfect. that it's roughly zero. So, so everything is set to go. Healthy and good for launch. So yes, has it been a busy lead up? To get here? Yes, yes. Apart from the uh, simulation campaign, we had a lot of uh, testing to make sure that the uh, all the ground segment and yeah, all all the tools that we use mm. are set in place and uh, okay. ready for uh, for operations. Mm -hmm. So it has been quite busy. Yeah. So what will be going through your head when you see this the rocket lift off? Well, I'll be indeed very happy and very excited uh, for. You know, having two satellites to, to control. Excellent. <laughs> and one last question, if we can. We yes, asked please. Pascal, what's the best thing about working here? I think the best thing is uh, the fact that we are actually operating satellites that are orbiting the Earth. Yeah. So it's uh, that's in it, that in itself is pretty exciting, and uh, I think that's well. the best thing of working here. Oh, well, in I think so too. Yes. So thank you very much <laughs> and you. good luck. We're going thank to you. leave the control room now and go back to the briefing room and uh, let everyone get on with the, the job of getting Sentinel 1B okay, launched you. tonight. But so here in the briefing room, the teams are getting ready to hand over. We heard Pascal tell us about the B shift. Uh, their shift is coming to an end, and the A team will go on console in the main control room here at two hours before launch of Sentinel-1. And uh, the different positions, uh, we walked around them quite quickly because we wanted to let them get back to their work. But um, we were with Sebastian on the back row here. The back row on the left here is where we control all of the ground systems, so our tracking stations, our antennas, uh, and also all of the software and computer hardware we need. The other back row here is the console where we manage the mission from. So sitting in the middle there is Juan Pinheiro, the B-team flight director. And uh, he's also got with him representatives from ESA Project, who are the people that are responsible for the Sentinel-1B satellite um, across the whole life cycle of its development. Then the front of the room is all of the spacecraft control areas. So in the middle section, we have the spacecraft operations man manager, Alistair O'Connell. Um, we also have our timeline engineer and analyst. So these are the people, uh, the manager is managing the whole of the front row, and the other positions are taking care of m tracking the timeline and making sure that at every step we know what we should be doing in this room. And then all along the front row there, as you saw, we have the engineers uh, that are responsible for keeping track of Sentinel-1B and keeping it healthy and flying it to orbit. So that's what we're doing here today. There's a lot more we could tell you, but we want to go back to tweeting to all of you about what's going on this evening. And uh, we need to let the teams here get ready for the launch, which we hope will be in uh, just about two hours and 27 minutes from now. Our countdown clock is running. And so far here at ESOC, we are go for launch. Thank you very much.